Shall we bow our heads in a word of prayer? Father, again we come in the precious name of Jesus, asking for a new anointing from heaven and for divine illumination upon the word. Speak to our hearts once again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have your Bibles. I want us to turn to Jer the book of Jeremiah, chapter 9. I'd also add, Brother Helm called me, I think it was yesterday, and sends his love and regard and thanksgiving to the church for all you've done for him. Jeremiah chapter 9, beginning with verse 23. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might, and let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I, the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, the mighty man in his might, or the rich man in his riches. Now the word glory here uh, carries with it the meaning of a coach that's just won a football, great football game, and uh, the players have picked him up and are carrying him off of the field, and they're glorying in that event. And God says, don't get excited about your wisdom, your might, or your riches, but if there's something you want to get excited about that's worthwhile, then get excited about the Lord. So, why not glory in wisdom? Because there's coming a day when your wisdom won't be sufficient. I don't care how wise you are, there's going to be a day when it will be not sufficient to solve your problems. Same thing with might and your riches. There will be coming a day when you'll not be able to buy what you need. I don't care how much money you have, there's coming a day when you're going to find, and therefore God says, don't you glory in your riches because it'll fail you in the hour when you have need. Wasn't it Mary, Queen of Scot, who said, asked that I'll give half of my kingdom. When she was dying, I'll give half of my kingdom for a few more minutes to live. So another reason not to glory in your wisdom is that the wisest man in the world doesn't know very much. I don't care how wise a person is, he doesn't know very much. That's just why Socrates, the wisest man, of his day, sought out the wise people of his day and tried to find out, it, but he couldn't find a wise man because they all thought they knew something. And he said, you're not wise. And they got tired of it and gave him poison, made him drink poison because he was telling the truth. So I think it was Emerson who said, every man I meet is my superior in some way that I may learn from him. Well, that ought to help keep us humble. Instead of feel like we're superior to some people, Emerson, every man I meet is my superior in some way, in that I may learn from him. I thought of Carl Sagan, this great astronomer who studied the stars and probably knew the heavens better than any man. He was wise concerning the stars, but he didn't seem to know where he came from. He felt that we came from the dust of some other planet. What a tragedy, what a shame. Now, to know God, I don't mean just being saved. I mean to know God means to really get to know Him, to get acquainted with Him. And uh, so, I don't care, as long as you live, you'll never know all there is to know about God. So it's a lifelong process. The Bible says Jesus is the wisdom of God and the power of God. 
And in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, it said, Jesus was made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. During the war, when the bombs were falling on England, Bernard Shaw, this great writer, was in one of the churches, uh, and uh, while the bombs were falling, the group, this group of people stood and began to sing, Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. And Dr. Newton, who was standing beside Bernard Shaw, this great writer, said to Dr. Newton, he said, uh, I'd rather have written that song than all of the silly plays that I wrote. In that hour, he knew what was of value. He entertained England. They, they almost bowed at his feet. But in that hour, he said, I would rather have written that one song than all of the silly plays that I wrote. What a difference. Someone said all the paths of glory lead to the graves. I want to turn in Philippians and look at the Apostle Paul, the third chapter. Paul is saying here that he counted all things but lost that he might know Christ. The 10th verse, he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of God. He goes on to say, not that he'd already attained, but look at the 13th verse. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. This one thing I do. Paul had narrowed his life down to one thing. Wasn't he a fanatic? Come on now, stick with me. He narrowed his life down to one thing. That was to know God. All of it, you say, well, Brother uh, Morgan, Paul made tents for a living. Yes, he did, but that was a sideline. His one thing in life was to know God and know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. To know God. So the calling is so high. He said, I pressed toward the calling of, the, of Jesus Christ. It is so high that he had narrowed his life down to just one thing. Now he said here in this thing, he said, forgetting those things which are behind. What did he have to forget? Paul said, I'm pressing, I was one thing, I've narrowed my life down to one thing, and because of that he said, I've, I've forgotten. All, all the things of the past. Forgetting those things. What did he have to forget? Do you suppose that he forgot the little children that he'd made orphans? Do you suppose they plagued his mind? I've often I've thought a number of times, how did Paul sleep at night? When he left these little children crying with their mother because the father had been taken off to prison and he cast his vote to put them to death, he left these orphans and he said, is he going to forget it? How about the wives that were made, the women that were made widows? Not just one, but one after another, in one city after another. Paul made these women widows and left them. I don't know how they got along financially. And I've wondered sometimes, what did Paul do? How could he sleep nights? When he said, I'm the chief of sinners, he wasn't just talking. He was the chief of sinners. And I don't know how he slept at night, unless miraculously God enabled him to be able to put this behind him. So Paul, what did he have to forget? So not only what did he have to forget and what the things that he had done, but he had to forget what had been done to him. I wish I could get that across to you. I don't know how many people carry around with them things that have been done to them. Paul had to forget the things that were done to him. Not little things either. Stonings, beatings, imprisonment, hunger, thirst. 
He had to forget everything that had been, if he carried anything around that had been done to him, it would keep him from knowing God. Dear Jesus, have mercy. How important is it to know God? We can have access to his wisdom. We don't need to worry about earthly wisdom. We have access to his wisdom. Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God, and he was made into us wisdom. The Bible says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That means the wisdom of God is available to every child of God. It's available to you. Wisdom for every situation you're in, God's wisdom is available to you. The same thing is true of his power. The strongest man in the world isn't very, really very powerful. We can't even whip the common cold. And we think we know something or we're powerful. Take the strongest man that you in the world and put him up here and one little germ can fell him. So the wisdom of God is available to us. The power of God is available to us. Forget the power on the earth, but the power of God, which is far greater, as is available to every one of us in this building this morning. God's power. And it says in the word of God, with God all things are possible. Everything, everything that needs to be done, his power can do it. There is nothing hard for God to do. There is nothing hard nor easy with him. They're all the same, all the same. So whatever situation, whatever power is needed, God's power is available to you. Well, no wonder God said, don't glory in your wisdom and in your power and in your riches, but glory in me. This is where you have the riches and power and wisdom that's available to you. And God's riches are available to the least saint. I don't care how poor you are, God's riches are available to you so that he can take care of absolutely every need that you have. Why? Because his riches are available to you. So I'm trusting that God will help us. He narrowed, Paul narrowed his life down to one thing. That is anything that made him more Christ-like. Anything that will make you more Christ-like, narrow your life down to that. That's the most precious thing in the world. Because to know God, dear ones, is better than being the wisest man in the world. To know God. To know God is more valuable than to be the strongest man in the world. And to know God is of more value than to be the richest man in the world. We say that, but can we get a hold of it? I think of Carey, wasn't it William Carey who went to China as a missionary, I believe it was, and he cobbled shoes. He was a cobbler. He said, my job, though, was being a missionary carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, I cobble shoes on the side. His job was a sideline. <laughs> did you get that? His job was a sideline. Not the main thing in his life, but he did that as a sideline to keep him spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was the one thing that he had and stayed with it all of his life. He stayed with it. Imagine narrowing your life down to one thing. So, I want you to know, if you do narrow your life down to one thing, I want you to know that it'll pay rich dividends. Today, people invest money in stock and things like that. They want to put it where the highest dividends of their investment. But Paul knew that to know Christ was the highest dividend that there could possibly be. Anything you've invested in the kingdom of God will produce and eventually pay more dividends than any money invested in any stock market anywhere. You'll not lose that, but you may lose the stock market. So, they, I don't know much about the stock market, but they say to make money in the stock market, you have to put it in for the long haul. Now, I want you to know, dear ones, that your commitment to Christ should be for the long haul. 
If you want to get anywhere with God, then you start with a long haul, whatever the future is. And the first few days may be bleak and barren, like Abraham when he got to Canaan and saw the famine in the land and giants there, but he was in it for the long haul. As it says in Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if we faint not. The man who wants a quick return on his spiritual investment will often be disappointed. A man who starts out with Jesus and looking for a quick return, quick investment, he's going to be disappointed. Look at God's men. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, and in due season he will, exalt, he will exalt you in due season. That's in his heart. You start with God for the long haul, and the first times or first few years or so may be rough, and even later on may be rough, but stick with it on the long haul, it'll pay dividends. The men that God used were men that were in for the long haul. Joseph. In due season, he was exalted to the throne of Egypt after 13 years of being in prison uh, and in, 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 in chains, slavery. Look at David, was exalted in due time to the throne of Israel. In due season, after 15 years of running for his life, anybody here run for 15 years for your life? You think you had it bad. Read some of these men, but they were in it for the long haul. They weren't looking for a quick return on their investment. How many people are disappointed in God because they don't seem to get a, a quick return? I prayed and God didn't answer my prayer. I'm through. God have mercy. You will fail every time on something like that. Be in it for the long haul. If you want an investment from God, if you want a return, then be in it for the long haul. Moses was exalted after 40 years on the back side of the desert, tending sheep. This man trained in all the wisdom of Egypt and God put him out there. He was in it for the long haul. I hope I can get that across. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. Look at Abraham. God promised him a son. And after 25 years, it says in, in Romans, the fourth chapter, when all hope was gone, he hoped on. The Berkeley version has it. I like it very well. Said when hope was gone, he hoped by faith. He believed when there was no evidence of hope. There was no evidence of hope, and he couldn't, he had no hope whatsoever that he'd get a son, but he hoped by faith. He was in it for the long haul, not for a quick investment. Well, how can we know God? Well, by prayer and obedience in the Word. Mother Teresa, people say, well, I'm, I'm not qualified to pray or I'm not a good prayer. Mother Teresa said, you learn to pray by praying. You pray, whether you're, whether you're qualified or whether you're not. You pray and God will begin to teach you as you pray. And you'll help become the person you want to be as you pray. You're the kind of person you ought to be before you pray. You start praying now, and God will help you to be the person you want to be. But start now, and God will come through. One other thing Mother Teresa said I like very well. She said, start with silence. Because it's there, you can begin to hear. And she really feels sorry for most Americans because there's so much noise in this country. It's hard to get alone, hard to get quiet. But start with silence and listen to God and then utter your prayers to God. What a wonderful thing God will help in answering prayer. So I'm trusting here ones, we'll listen to Jeremiah, not glory in our wisdom or our might, for our riches, but glory in this that we know the Lord. It's the greatest thing to glory in that there is.